Um, thank you guys all for coming for the Freedom Haven Project uh, presentation. Um, I want to start with something, and thank you for, for hosting us, Amy. I appreciate it. Um, in 1925, um, Ayn Rand fleed uh, communist Russia. In 1957, she published Atlas Shrugged. Who here has read Atlas Shrugged? This is Gold's Gulch. Twice. Yes. Um, John uh, Aguilar optioned the film rights in 1992. And then in 2011 to 2014, he and Harmon Caslow released a three-part movie of the book um, called Atlas Shrugged, part one, two, and three. We're actually showing those at our site uh, tonight, tomorrow, and next night, each of the three parts. Um, and they, they were actually um, very inspirational for, for me and for a lot of people. And it's actually the reason why this project was, was one of the reasons this project was created in the movie. And I was going to show the video of it. We did this, um, the Galt's um invitation to the various people this is you want to go where, where people respect individual freedom um the government doesn't doesn't sue your property all these things things like that that is what we wanted and and the invitation to go out um when galt does his speech at the very end before they all disappear and before new york's light turns off and it's the end of the book um he invites people to go and start creating your own communities and and of freedom and 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 foster this during this time and that's exactly what we're trying to do um this is good morning um we're using um we're not really inventing anything new here this is all existing stuff this is tried and tested technologies we're just putting it together in a different way that has never been used before um this is a freedom project well can you guys see it is it bright enough okay um, have you guys seen Schindler's List? Mm -hmm. we, we watched that actually a couple of nights ago. I have not. I've still never seen it. No, you know what it's about, right? Yeah. Okay. <clears throat> uh, do, do you want to want another chair over here? No, 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 okay. Um, the, if the Jews had known what was in store for them, they, a lot of Jews were actually trying to trying to flee Germany before before everything happened. They were trying to seek refugee status in America, and America is a whole you know some terrible things that we actually were blocking a lot of Jews from coming over for various reasons, and that was that was terrible. Um, but if they had if they had known just how bad it was was going to be, um, I imagine many if not all of them would probably have just said, I don't care if the country's going to take the state. I don't care if I have to end up in prison in that country. That's better than the concentration camps, and so they they would just left any way they could have. Um, but but leaving leaving your country is a very very difficult thing. If tomorrow a country out there had all the freedoms you you saw for, like a hundred percent of all this every social freedom and every economic freedom you you you, you believed in, and existed tomorrow, no taxation, very minimal or non-government. Whether it's anarchy or not, it really depends on your definition because the government's so small that some people call it anarchy, some people call it minimal government, but they're both right. Um, because you can't murder, kidnap, and steal, and they will stop you if they do. So you know, and you'll be handcuffed, and definitely you whatever. Um, so, <laughs> how many would be willing to move to that country? Minarchy. Yeah, but it, it's difficult. Most most people actually would not be willing to do that because it takes a lot to actually make someone a refugee. Um, and uh, sorry, also before we start, I wanted to, to I've already started. I wanted to find what I mean by freedom. Um, because freedom means a lot, there's a lot of different definitions of freedom. You're soaring high in the clouds in a glider. That's freedom. Oh, I feel free. I have enough money that I can buy whatever I want. That's financial freedom. Um, I have clarity of mind. And there's all these different definitions of freedom. Those, those are all valid. But I'm, here we're specifically talking about one, one freedom, which is basically social freedom and economic freedom. To better understand what that is, it's, it's easier to understand what the opposite of that is. Force and compulsion is if something's threatening your life, freedom, or property. Freedom is everything you can do in the absence of those. So if no one's coming by to steal from you, kidnap you, or, or kill you, then that's your freedom. It doesn't matter if you're poor, it doesn't matter if you're rich, it doesn't matter where you are in the world, if no one's if no one's using force against you, you're free. That's that's the definition we're talking about. Morning. Morning. Hey, you can have this one if you want. Very good, thank you. Um any questions on that? My question is, would you like me to ask a question in order to fill the dead time while, you drink, while you're drinking water? <laughs> I'm trying to get the answer. Um, <laughs> thank you for being here. <laughs> um, in the 30-year war, the, the, the Protestant war, 
Um, there was the number of people that were killed in Europe uh, was was around the same percentage of the Civil War. Actually, I think it was a little more actually. Um, so it was it was very very bloody. And a lot of people fled at different places. One of the groups became the Pilgrims that came over to America. At that point, America was a new frontier, untamed land, the new world. Um, the, the first couple of years, because they implemented communism, didn't understand how the whole freedom thing worked, it failed. But then when they started implementing freedom and actually had private property, even though it still was imperfect because they had taxation, but um, it, was, it was much better and they started prospering. This became the foundation of the country we live in today. Um, but that was, that's an example of refugees that, that not only left their country to go into the country, they left their country to, exit, to, to go to a, a new frontier to find freedom. Not, not to, from one government to another government. They went from one government to nothing. Um, Navi, Illinois, um, the, the Mormon Exodus, or the members of the Church of Jesus Christ Latter-day Saints. Um, the, how many of you know about Navi, Illinois? <clears throat> Heard of it. Um, it, it. At the time, Navi, Illinois was actually bigger than Chicago. Uh, um, they they were a group. Uh, it was a religious group that was migrating west, uh, trying to find freedom because their their religious beliefs were, were different than, than uh, some conventional ones at the time. But they were against slavery. Illinois was a pro, pro slavery state, and suddenly they move into an area where they had a majority vote, and the locals didn't like that very much. And that it was also one of the reasons why they um, there was there was a lot of contention, and they end up having their lives threatened and so forth. And they fled west. They went over to the, the Mexico territories, basically the left United States at the time, and that later on became what we have Utah today. So they're also an example of uh, basically people fleeing, looking for freedom, and end up escaping to um, to a new new place, a new territory, un, 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 um, untamed territory to, to attain that. Um, the UN today estimates that there is uh, 25.4 million refugees as of 2017, so it's actually much more than that. Um, 25.4 million refugees in the world who have left their country to try to escape whatever they is they're, they're escaping there. This here is the um, Zatara refugee camp in Jordan. It's 1.5 million refugees. Uh, this is in 2013. There's a lot of poverty here um, because there isn't a free market here. Um, I, I would I would put forth the proposal that if they had a free market here they would turn this into a paradise. Mm. And there's an example of this I wanted to show of, of this. You guys know the story of Hong Kong? Um, this, is, this is Hong Kong between 1868 and 1872. Um, uh, the, the Opium Wars where UK and China were, got went to war over the Silk Road, basically. Um, they, um, UK won conquered a small small island of, of, of Hong Kong and then later made this arrangement with with China to um, to basically lease a larger section of it for 99 years and that basically became the Hong Kong that we, we know of today Hong Kong is a barren rock in the ocean there's not much resources to speak of I mean they used to have fish but really it's just a rock in the ocean right and yet because the people in Hong Kong that the person who administrated that chose to take the, the, the stance of hands off and just let them do what they, they wanted to. They had the highest level of economic freedom in the world, even more in America. We're actually number 25 currently. We, we're, we're sinking down lower. Um, James Clavel, Noble House, describing that very well. You want to tell us a little about it? What? You want to tell us a little about it? No, it's a long book. Oh, <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Um, so this, is, this is Hong Kong modern. It's, it's, a, it's a very wealthy third world, na first world nation. Um, and that's just because of freedom. It, with freedom, no matter how bad your situation is, you can make the best of it. Yes, if you have lots of resources, it's even better, but you can be a rock in the middle of the ocean and, and you prosper really well. Um, can you guys see that very well in this brightness? Okay. So if you, if you apply that same economic freedom to these refugee camps, imagine what, the, what they could do. Our plan is actually to make a home for about five to 10,000 of these refugees or anyone else who wants to be part of it um, to provide them that level of economic freedom. Anyone else who wants to join them? This is a, a quick map of the economic freedom of America. America is number 25, the pink one. Um, the red one is the world average. Singapore is, was currently the highest number one. Hong Kong disappeared because China took it back. Um, uh, Sweden actually got a little better over the years. And so did uh, 
Lithuania. Basically, yeah, you know, but even so, even number one, Singapore has an economic freedom index of, I believe, like 86, actually, I wrote it down right here, 84.4%. 80, that basically implies that they have 15.6% of tyranny. And if you think of Singapore, can you think of, of tyranny, tyrannous, I can never pronounce it right. Tyrannical. Tyrannical. Thank you. That's what it was. I was, I was the wrong word. Tyrannical things that, that Singapore does to a citizen's free today. You guys heard the stories about those? They're, they're a lot of people being arrested, usually for social freedom things. So even like if you litter, you can you know, get lashes or something. Yeah. <laughs> even though they're the freest country in the world, that doesn't really say much. It's kind of like being on the top deck of a sinking ship. Um, New, New Hampshire is the freest state in America. The same USA that's losing its freedom is now number 25. It's the same principle. I mean, I love that New Hampshire is a free state, and I hope that the, the secessionist movement succeeds. That'd be awesome. Where's Taiwan here? Hmm. Um, this is this is from the um, heritage.org. They only choose it once, and it only let me choose five items. So yeah, I've heard that in Taiwan, if you get caught with one bullet, it's ten years in jail. Yeah, hmm. Taiwan doesn't have that much freedom. No. Um, Good luck when the Chinese come over the hill. Mm -hmm. Okay, so, um, sorry, the freedom here in the place we're, we're, we're establishing, we, we estimated would have an economic freedom index of 95. And the reason why it'd be 95 instead of 100 is because we think we'll be imperfect and we'll make mistakes. How we implement the government, the government or the agreed contract you come in and you sign, however, when you'll call it, whether it's an anarchy or a minimal government, it's kind of, it's small enough that people would disagree about what it was, what it is, but it's, it's that kind of thing. It's everything the anarchists want, everything that minarchists want, um, will be about 95. So basically the freest, the freest country in the world. Um, how you plan to do that is um, in the 1970s, guys, you guys ever watch uh, Rose Island on net, net Netflix? Do you want to tell us really quick what, what happened on that? Oh, okay. <laughs> um, there, there's this guy, I forgot his name, um, who was very much like us wanted to innovate. He built his own car um, and, and it, was, it was a unique style and whatever. He just, and he didn't have a license plate because he said it wasn't a manufacturer, it was whatever because of the law. He wouldn't have to, but he ended up in prison anyways. You know, so he's like, I, I'm sick of this government. I want to I want to go where there is no government. And so he wanted to go offshore of, of Italy. And back then, the, the territorial waters was three, three miles. He went like five or six miles offshore and built himself a floating, floating um, platform. There was nothing on it. It was just Look, there's a floating platform. We anchored to the ground, and it's just there, you know. But because it offered freedoms that weren't on land, everything started flowing to it. It became a party ship, and people, you know, it became a bar and all these other places. And before they knew it, they decided to call it Rose Island, and they petitioned the UN to they recognize them as an actual actual state. The the UN was actually in the process of recognizing them as a formal country when Italy was upset by the whole thing, and they went out there, seized it, and sank it. Um, but because of that. The UN actually created, uh, that became the, the seeds of the United Nations Convention on the Law of the Sea, where they want all the countries to come together and agree on where your boundaries are. We don't want these kind of conflicts to happen in the future. You know, let's, let's agree about what these different things are. I mean, territorial waters is 12 nautical miles. Contiguous zone is, is 24 nautical miles. Exclusive economic zone is 200 nautical miles. And the freedom you seek can be found outside the exclusive economic zone. The dark, I don't know if you can tell the difference between a light blue and dark blue out there. The dark blue is outside the specific economic zone. There is no country out there. Now, there's a caveat because if you are flying a flag without if flying, if you're on a vessel without a flag, then they all agree that you're a pirate ship and they can seize your your vessel. So that's a caveat. But if you're flying a a flag from a country, most of those countries' laws don't actually apply to you unless they specifically write a law that applies on the ocean. Um, and all the international ones that most of the countries have signed, there's a four pillars of, of international maritime law, um, apply basically just to the ship and to the crew, but not to the passengers. So our goal is to go out, is to have a ship out here that is act as a floating port city um, that will have basically will have some regulations on the ship, some regulations on the crew, but not on the passengers. So the passengers will be initial population of about five to ten thousand people will have all the freedoms you guys seek. And eventually our goal is to have them recognize our own flag. The International Maritime Organization in the UK, if they recognize our flag, then we can have our own flag and we can say, well, 
you know, we need those laws, and you know, now we have all, now that now the ship and crew can all that have the freedoms as well. Any questions on this? Yeah, my question is: the flags have nothing to do with the machine guns. Exactly. Bullets go right through the flags. Uh huh. So what are you doing to defend the place from pirates? Pirates won't be an issue. They won't. Can you imagine what would happen if you took a Somali pirate, maybe even all five of them, and ages <laughs> between twelve and sixteen on there with their machine gun? Probably the first time they've held it in their life. I maybe not. I know maybe they. Just no, I'm do them talking more. government pirates. Oh, those pirates. That's different. Somali pirates won't be an issue. I mean, can you imagine if they dropped it here in in, in Pork Fest? They'd be going, "Hey, stick it up!" And everyone's like, like oh, "I was just joking. Good job, man, boy." You know. But uh, yeah, government pirates. That is actually going to be. Uh, that is the biggest concern we have. Um, and that will take, that is a multiple part answer because none of, there's no actual guarantee, but there are many things we can do that increase it. Um, I can go through a list, list of them really quick. One is we'll have, um, because we're flying with a flag vessel, any attack on our vessel is an attack on the country that flag belongs to. That doesn't necessarily stop the United States, but it does mean something, you know? Um, the second one is we will have free and open trade with everyone because our government or whatever contract it is says nothing about what you can buy and sell as long as you aren't selling people you know or you, I, I, probably buying murder might be illegal too because you're but you have to prove it that you're actually murder whatever you know so pretty much the government would have no control over economy so you'll have free and open trade with everyone so if you're trading with a country and providing them services they like and they, they like that arrangement you know what's it what's the saying um, when trades when goods cross borders soldiers seldom do so that's that's the second one. Well, we'll how we'll have open trade. The third one is the um, the biggest uh, bully on the ocean is the U.S. government. We're planning to be right here in the South Bay of Bengal between Singapore and Sri Lanka, where 75 percent of the world's traffic go through. So you can still buy stuff on Amazon. It may just take an extra day or two before it gets to you. Um, <laughs> or not even. Just a day or two. <laughs> Eventually, yes. Do, do you have okay. a country? The first, in mind? the first year, maybe a week or two. But right. we're, we, we, want we're 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 going to be a floating port city. We want the ships to come to us, dock with us, and be part of that whole system. Right. And especially with the way imports and exports happen, different laws, it might be countries that would just come to us, trade to another ship, just to go out there again, just to bypass stuff. Do you have a country in mind that you would fly the flag for? We're thinking of Liberia. Okay. Liberia is a very unique situation, and I'll, I'll, I'll tell you that in just a second. The rest of that okay. list. This is exciting. I love this stuff. <laughs> Don't let me forget that library thing. Um, another thing we have is we're going to have a 24 um, 7 video feed of what's going on in, in Freedom Haven. Not violating anyone's privacy if they want to, but, but basically showing what life on Freedom Haven is, is like. If we ever get attacked or anything's going on, the whole world will know about it in real time. Um, Elon Musk ha and, and Starlink has given us bandwidth level internet access from anywhere in the world. I have it, Starlink at home, and it's excellent. <laughs> no, I'm not a sponsor, <laughs> but it is, it is excellent. It's faster than my actually local connection speed, and we we've developed a, a protocol, a kind of a BitTorrent streaming BitTorrent kind of protocol, where in real time you will not only have the video feed that you're watching, but you'll have the original source copy of it that will also stream out to anyone else who's also watching from you with like a one second latency on it. So basically, everyone in the world will have this video. You can't destroy it, and they so they can't silence us. They can't keep the world from seeing what happens. Do you guys know um, in um, in the Rocky War? Do you guys know why we stopped just short of Baghdad in the Rocky War? We didn't actually actually seize control of Iraq the first time. That's right. Know. That wasn't the Iraqi War. That was the Kuwait War. Right. Kuwait War. Why in the Kuwait War we didn't actually seize? We 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 got Kuwait back and we basically almost conquered all of Iraq and we stopped just short. What? How many miles? Fifty miles? Something like that. Yeah, really short of Baghdad, and we just stopped and then we left. Do you know why we did that? No. Nope. Because that was the first year. That's when CNN came out, first time. That's the back when CNN was actually doing good stuff. <laughs> um, they were. Um, they actually allowed the public for the first time to see the war happening as it laid out, and that visibility made the war very, very unpopular. Even though what was happening in the war was the same as all the other wars, when they saw the the highway of death as we basically just plowed through there, the the, the popularity it was so unpopular for us to be there that we we retreated from that war when we were the clear victors they had no they had no shot to talk with us um and it's just because of visibility so we're gonna have that on our side as well we're gonna have 100 percent visibility on everything that happens on a high level 
no private, no privacy, whatever. Just it, it, it that'd be great for advertising. Anytime you want to have a company, you want to show, hey, what is it? Look at these things, whatever. Whatever you want to show the time is, we'll just choose, but it'll be constantly streaming 24 7. If there's an attack that happens, anything that's going on, they'll also be on there. So the world will have a constant stream and know exactly what's going on here. Uh, so extra visibility. Also, we'll have diplomacy. Um, we'll reach out to other countries and try and form relationships and so forth. But all those different things, and, and more, more so, but there's none of those are guarantees the government won't come and, and attack us and destroy us. But they're enough deterrence that we hope that we'll have as much success as every island nation out there does because they're just as vulnerable to the same attacks as we are. Does I've got question? another uh, different motive for not Hacker in Baghdad. Yeah. The military industrial complex said, let's save these people for future war and we'll make more money in the future because that's what it's all about. War is a racket. It, it, so yep. they were seeing. Corny capitalism. Seeing the the uh, retreat as a an investment in the future, exactly. Um, but I have another story. Yeah. There was a treasure salver who found a shipwreck in the Caribbean that was loaded with platinum, and so they went to the United States Maritime Court, and the Maritime Court said, "These are international waters. You find that treasure, that's yours." So they went to the international court, and the international court said, "International waters, that treasure is yours." So they went out and started pulling up the treasure, and a Dominican Republic gunboat came along and said, Hi, these are Dominican Republic waters. You're going to share your treasure with us now, aren't you? And they didn't see any choice. I mean, what are they going to do? They've got 50 caliber machine guns pointed at you. So they split the treasure with the Dominican Republic. That's terrible. Were and they... that's what I'd like to see avoided here. Where, where, how far from the shore were they? I don't know. But it was outside of the Dominican Republic. I wonder if that one of the problems with this is that one of the most common terms that's thrown around is international waters. International waters is not actually defined in national law, which means sometimes it means 12 nautical miles, sometimes it means 200 nautical miles, and because of the discrepancy, governments use that in your, their advantage. They they can they can they can seize control of a vessel that's 20 nautical miles from shore, and say and and, and that's completely within their jurisdiction. But then advertise, hey, we just seized this vessel that was in international waters. So I was like, oh my goodness, that government is so scary. We better do everything it says. And you know, that the, the Coast Guard does that all the time. You know, um, and we see it in the news. Um, but that's all within a jurisdiction. So we don't we don't say international waters. We say outside the exclusive economic zone. There's no real short term for that. Short, uh, a, a smaller, concise term for that. But that's why it's important. Because I imagine I don't know if it happened there, but I imagine if the Dominican public said these are our waters. It may have been very well been their waters, but because the people were using the term international waters, they may have said, okay, well, this is 30 miles or even 100 miles offshore. That's okay. We can do that. But then Dominican Republic says, well, actually, you're within 200 nautical miles. So it's our jurisdiction. Believe it or not, despite how much the countries fight with each other, even the U.S., who, who actually has not signed a United Nations Convention on the Laws, they actually uphold it. They actually, actually abide by it. I, Other than the Cuban Missile Crisis, where the U.S. was actually seizing ships that was 500 nautical miles from shore, but that was because of the nuclear threat, whatever, and that was that was down here. Um, other than that situation, I have not found instances of the U.S. actually breaking the United Nations Convention of Law to Sea when it comes to these things here. Um, they did uh, take a a drug drug submarine that was over here somewhere, but it wasn't flagged, so they could take it that way. Uh, they they do stuff down here all the time. And maybe even in other people's waters, and people say, "Oh, that's international waters." Yeah, but that's all—all all this down here, so for that small hole there, and a few places here, that's all part of some country. And they have agreements with other countries that those countries say, "Yes, if that ship's in our water, you may police them and do that stuff here." So, um, Liberian flag. Yes. Um, Liberia is a unique situation because Liberia is a country is a terrible country. It's constantly a civil war. You never know who's in charge at any one time. But there's money to be made. Oh. Um, Back up one second. Uh, countries' flags has become a business. They've become a free market in a sense, where countries say, "You're going to pay us thousands of dollars to fly our flag. I want that business." And so countries are competing with each other. Their, their registries are competing with each other to charge less than the other ones and have fewer controls and fewer regula regulations because they want your business. You're going to give us ten thousand dollars a year? Great. I don't have to do anything. You know, yeah. I love it. Yeah. And and because of that, Liberia, even though they're 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 Terrible as a country, low freedom. The people there are starving. I was I was told there was cannibalism there. It's it's a terrible country to be in. They outsourced 
their ship registry to some country, some company in Virginia, and that company handles all the ship registry for it, and and, and they then sent back to Liberia twenty five percent of the profits they make each year. So Liberia does nothing, and they just get this big fat multi million dollar check every year, which is great to whichever regime happens to be in power at that time, <laughs> and also ten percent of it goes to uh, welfare out there. Um, so Liberia isn't in the isn't about trying to enforce any of their laws. That being said, the international maritime laws that they've signed, the way those are set up is that any country can enforce those laws. If you're in another country's ports, they will, they, they, you have a flag of this country that signed those laws, they will have their inspectors and they'll do their whatever. But we're never gonna go into port. Even though we're gonna still gonna apply, apply, uh, comply with those laws, they'll apply to the ship and to the crew. They have nothing to do with the passengers. Question um, for you. Knowing a little about ships and stuff like that, about how many people fit on a cruise ship? Just so I can pick up your <laughs> sizes of things. Um, it depends. Cruise ships come from just a little bit bigger than a yacht to these big mega... Yeah, yeah, the, the big megas. I'm the big you, mega ones. How many people 10,000. 10,000. 10, 10, so, yeah. and you're talking about a community of 10,000. Mm -hmm. Okay, all right. This, 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 will be, this will be similar to a cruise ship, except that... A cruise ship is a snapshot. It's a centrally planned economy right. that's a snapshot in time, tailored to try to mimic the ultra wealthy lifestyles. You have steak, you have lobster, or whatever it is. Um, on our ship, there'll be free market, which means you can still have all those things. You just go out and buy it when you feel like it. It won't be presented to you all the time. There's no waste and so forth. Those cruise ships you can live right now for the, the minimum of eighty thousand dollars a year per person. We're going for something where the average is going to be about twenty thousand dollars per person. And the minimum is going to be about five thousand dollars per person if you want to live the way the, the, the naval people do on naval ships, where you have dunks and so forth. Not very comfortable living, but you'll be fine. And you can refugees can get in the door that way, and if they don't have any more money, and then prosper and grow, and then they'll be able to afford, you know, as they move up. That's what free markets do. Uh, will you be including space to produce food and filter water? I assume generating power, or will mm -hmm. most of the food? resources be supplied by the, the market um <clears throat> what we're actually providing um in <clears throat> in essence this is a real estate this is a real estate project we're providing a space for the free market the free market exists out there and there are people who take their private yachts and they go out in the middle of the ocean and like now i'm in a free market that's great and you're like okay i guess i'll just sit here for a couple months until my food runs out and then i'll go back to shore and get a job and it turns into basically just a summer vacation. You see people in there, they're selling yachts and so forth. And you also kind of need to be a little bit rich to do that. Um, oh, free pancakes, 9 to 11, if you have them in there. Um, Thank you. Uh, but what we're basically offering is just a space for people that community exists. With that, we're offering two things with that. It's basically a bare service. We're not going to furnish it, whatever. It's just, here's your space. Um, we're offering septic, what comes with it, and also uh, airflow. And we'll have electricity for the ship for its power, maintenance, and functionality. But all the electricity and, and water and everything else we have will be supplied by the free market. Which means, if you want things from <laughs> locally, that's a business. Someone will supply it. Just like here at Portfest. If you want something and it, it's lucrative, they want to make money from it, someone will provide it. Do if no one provides it, I'll provide it. You know? Desalination? Uh, desalination will be, be one of the services that people provide. And we'll have our own own own, own machines that do it down below. And um, the problem is you don't want you don't want essentially plan the economy you don't want us to come in and, says, and we're providing all these things for you because then you just go back to the cruise industry because no, no matter how well we do your desalination someone else will come along and be able to do a higher quality and lower cost than what we're providing so we're not going to lock it into what we're doing we're going to let the free market work out there and again if no one provides it because i don't know what i'm going to be doing out there <laughs> so i'm looking for whatever that niche is in the market that doesn't exist yet because that's what i want to do even if i don't know how to do it i'll learn that's you know it's great um so, um, let, me show, let me show you the ships. This is 200 miles offshore? 200 nautical miles offshore. Uh, these are some people that have retired in cruise ships. They range from like $75,000 a year to uh, $200,000 a year. Um, I forgot their names. Um, they're famous people. Um, they, they've, they, they, they live 24 hours a day. They, they, they retired on cruise ships. Uh, this is the, the high end of cruise ships. They, they charge like $1 million to $10 million per room. And they, people live on this ship and it slowly sells around the world. Doesn't offer more freedom. But this is the technology and the cost of those those ones. On the low end for cruise ships, this one here is Life at Sea Cruises. Um, they charge thirty thousand dollars per person per year. Uh, they also sell around the world, but again, they don't offer you more freedom, you know. But this is the technology um, that exists today.
And this is the Symphony of the Seas. This is a 10, 10 million, there's like 10,000 people. What, what's a couple extra drills among friends? Um, <laughs> this is uh, the Symphony of the Seas cruises. And I actually have a three minute video that I, I, I did at the beginning, which kind of just goes through the whole thing. But people, even, it's so huge. It's hard to imagine just how huge these things are. Does anyone, well, show of hands, do you want to see the three minute introductory video? The guy took an hour of walking through the whole ship and he only covered like half the ship. And he squeezed it down really fast in three minutes. That goes through the whole thing really fast. Who wants to see it? Who doesn't? I uh, say, see three yes and uh, four yes. And who says no? Okay, we have two no. Okay, so yes, yes is have it. Okay, so we'll, we'll go show it. If, if you get starry eyes, you can take a nap, whatever. It's three minutes long. At last time, people started getting glossy glass eyed and, you know. I've been on the oasis of the sea, so I'm pretty Oh, yes, yeah, so you know exactly what I'm talking Amazing. Yeah. I've only been on the Viking too. Uh, that's a north, 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 north. Uh, Norwegian uh, Viking. Yeah. Are you planning a single vessel, we're, actually, or <coughs> we're well, actually? I'll I'll show you what uh, we're planning. This is our current design right now. Um, this vessel. Now this is the, the the we're in phase two. We're in the there's four phases to the project. Phase one is the initial um, preparation. You know, do all the pieces add up? Do we have what we need? Can it be possible? How would the constitution look? How would this whole setup work? Phase two is the exploratory campaign. I'm out here and 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 we're basically trying to find out is there enough interest out there? Um, if we can get enough people to actually support the marketing campaign that we're doing then that means there's some interest. It doesn't guarantee the whole project will work, but if it doesn't work, then that means we'll at least stop it at this point. It's a $20,000 campaign that we're raising over the course of a four-year period, and we're basically approaching the second year of that. And this, the goal this year is to raise $2,000 here at Park Fest um, for that. So if you guys like it and want, want to encourage it, we encourage you to donate to the project. Um, keep forgetting to push that pause button. Um, but this is this is the main the main vessel. It's it's built like it's a combination between a, a container ship and a cruise ship. It has all the a amenities and and hookups for everything you need. But every cabin is modular in a sense. So you could actually have your business built and have your cabin however you want to do it, and it just gets shipped out there and it's just put put in place. Um, and there's a lot more complexity about that. But this has so four thousand cabins. Each, in each it. units could be like a, a twenty foot equivalent unit. To... Exactly. Yeah. And you can have much bigger if you want to. Uh, that, or that's kind of cool. You, you just get it built on land, yeah. and that that's clever. But you don't want to mention containers because even though even though um, tiny homes show that they're awesome, uh -huh. people have a hard time associating L containers and being trash bags. But they're not. They're they're in dust. They're engineering marvels that can carry lots of weight. Because I told someone says, well, if, what if I don't want to build out a container? What if I want to build out wood? I was like, that's fine. Let's do the math. So this wood can carry this much weight, this much tonnage, whatever it is, so that the walls have to be this thick. And this whole thing's this wide, which means you're going to have one foot of space. You could do that if you want to. There's nothing wrong with you building build out of wood if you want to. But this, this, the smartest, most efficient thing to do is to build it the way they're doing it today. They've optimized it. Um, how, do you, how are you going to plan uh, pathways between? Because obviously you could maximize the cargo units, mm -hmm. just... Next neck. Uh, We're not going. Yeah. It, are you just going to have like a system of hallways? Through yes. Or? Yes. Actually, because th this is not a container ship. A container ship can hold twenty four thousand TEUs. This can only hold four thousand TEUs, and that's because there's a, there's space above it. There's a space beside it. We have uh, three meters of space in hallways, big enough for industrial stuff to come through. Might be a little tight. That could fit, but it might be a little tight. Although you probably wouldn't have that because this is all within walking distance. So. Um, if you want to, you could. But the work on the exhaust and stuff, don't want to asphyxiate everyone. But, you know, it's free market. We'll figure out a way. Segway. Yes. Um, so, so, mining equipment. It's been done. Yeah. And, and also, the, the, the very bottom layer, if, if, there, if there are industries that want to build custom stuff, we could build it into this structure, noting that it's permanent and you won't be able to change the market. But if, like, there's big manufacturing machines that could be retooled into other stuff then maybe that's what they'll do and the heavy stuff on the bottom is is great for us anyway so um this is the harbor in the middle i don't have any ships shown here 
I have another picture that shows it in comparison to other ones. One of the pictures online had an aircraft carrier next to it, but then we spent all the time explaining, no, no, the aircraft carrier is not part of the design, it's just there for size. We would love to have an aircraft carrier, but that's six, that's $17.5 billion, and this strip here is $0.26 billion. $260 million is what the project's gonna be for, for 10 years for four cabin spaces, or basically five to 10,000 people. Um, this is one of the smaller cruise ships, the Empress of the Seas, the main Liberty vessel. Um, I have other picture that has the, the boats in it, but it gets really confusing. If you add boats to it, people are like, oh, the boats are part of it? No. So this is a harbor where you can do, uh, 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 ships can dock and, and do trade, whatever. But this is also a gantry crane on the top that you can have the big, big container ships can come up here and actually dock with it. It's only one gantry crane, but we're actually considering maybe doing two because Time is money for them, and the faster they can um, take stuff off and put stuff on, the better. And this here is a, a, a experimental prototype uh, floating concrete platform. Um, here are the estimated prices for each of the, each of the ones. Can you guys read that? Yep. Uh, cruise ships have an average cost of about $100,000 a year. The minimum is, is $30,000 a year. Here on the Liberty Vessel, the average is $20,000 a year, with the minimum being five. At $20,000 if you're an investor, Twenty-five thousand if you're if you're a renter. Most people want to be renters. Uh, an investor, what they do is they actually pay for the whole ten years in front, and that's the money that will actually be used and actually build the whole thing. So they, they pay up front, and this won't be, be built until three years after we get the money. So basically, they have a seven-year return on investment. They have to make up all their money back in the first four years. Long story short, they're going to be renting out their spaces if they're renting for like twice what they paid for it to make back the money in a seven-year period. So renters will pay a lot more in rent than what investors pay. Um, but everything else will still cost the same, which is why investors will pay an average of maybe $20,000 a year. These are all estimates, uh, the average. Um, about $20,000 a year, um, and renters will pay $25,000 a year because their rent will be much more expensive, but everything else will be the same. Out on the platform, you actually own each of those units. You actually buy a unit which is like about $150,000. It's a concrete uh, sphere with a triangle enclosure. Um, that's the pictures I can show you afterwards. It's all on our website, freehaven.org. We have all the designs, they're all on GrabCAD. Everything we have is open. If you guys want to take it and see, you want to take a different direction, run with it, you want to do a fork off of it, please do it, that's very much welcome. Um, this will cost more per year because you won't have as many options for power and water and so forth. You'll have one guy in the community that'll, that'll make water and there isn't much, as much of a, there isn't economies of scale to justify um, having multiple suppliers and so forth, you know, like here we have one pork showers, uh, and for three thousand people, um, I'll eventually we might have more. <laughs> Probably a bad example, uh, but here you're going to have multiple su suppliers of, of power, multiple suppliers of water, multiple suppliers of like power. They maybe maybe someone will, will charge as much for, for electricity. This one, over, this other guy charges much much less, but it's not always guaranteed. You have brownout once a week and once a month. And you have a power outage for an hour. You know, and if you're okay with that, maybe you'll pay half as much. I mean, it's a free market. You know, or this one of the guys provides water, and it is ultra filter radion, whatever it is. It costs this much. This one right here just does a simple reverse osmosis, and that's it. Or this one does evaporation, whatever it is. You you choose. You know, it's a free market. That's what's great about it. Something we we're not even familiar with. I can imagine actually deciding who you buy water from in your house or who to buy the electricity from. That the government took that away a long time ago. That's been socialized. Any other questions I missed? I love these questions. Keep them coming. Thank I you. I think on the uh, electricity part, I'd sign up for both, and you just uh, pay for whichever one you use, whichever is cheaper. Yeah. In fact, actually, that would probably probably what people do. They'll, they'll select off which ones they want, and they just flip over. In my house, I have two internet providers because I work from home, and I just have one as a backup if I ever need to. Um, so the concrete platform you're talking about is not modular units. It's going to be one rigid platform. Um, it each. You can't really see it here. This is 50, 50 uh, I think 52 platforms in a triangle configuration. Um, think of a concrete double hull sphere that's. Uh, uh, concrete reinforced with with basalt fiber rebar, so it doesn't it, it, it can last it can outlast a ship if it doesn't get broken. So it, it doesn't rust, it doesn't ever get old. It's just a piece of concrete. But then for them to, for them to touch connect with each other, you have a shell around it that's a triangle shell, and one of those those things is curved. So basically, it goes up against a flat surface. And I was I had hoped to actually have something three D printed and not a little model that can show what it looks like. But I'm a father of five, and I have we also partially fostered three other kids, and we're 
busy. <laughs> and so um, didn't get to do that. So I had to kind of visualize it. Um, the problem with having ships connected on the ocean is during waves, when they hit each other, they'll just destroy each other. Um, it's kind of like tornadoes are harmless. It's what the tornado throws at you that, that's the real problem. Um, or if, if it throws you somewhere. <laughs> Uh, so these here uh, will be we be, be uh, chained together, and there'll be a chain and a figure eight going around both of them around, around the sphere. But on the outside, there's this uh, triangle that one side rotates up. They both can rotate, but one of them's flat and one of them's curved. I don't want to do that. Um, and long story short, all these can, together, this thing will be like a mat on the ocean that will, that will move during severe weather. Nice. On normal days, you won't even notice anything. But on the, the once a year storm where the, the waves may actually go up to five meters, which is this high on the boat but down here you're more subject to the weather and so forth it's like camping um, although you have an actual home and stuff but people wanted to own their lands so believe it or not a lot of people wanted this over this so I'm, we'll do that if that's what they want did that answer your question oh <laughs> I have no idea that was five minutes ago <laughs> um, That was so much fun. Um, do you guys have any other questions? Anything uh, we, we need yeah. to cover? Yeah. Um, right I'm sure you've heard of. Oh Sealand. shoot! They found me. <laughs> I'm sure you've heard of Sealand. Yes. Um, what What are the lessons from that experiment that you have taken? There are actually on our site. We have a frequently asked questions page, and we have a list of like a hundred other projects that are similar or somehow related. People ask about it. Sealand's one of them. Um, Sealand is a f most most projects out there enjoy the fact that they can they can claim that they're independent from a country, right? But they don't actually promise freedom. Like there's Liberland as well, which uh, is uh, a part between Croatia and whatever country it was that's unclaimed. But neither of the countries claim it, so they went in and they claimed it, right? Um, and they set it up Liberland, it, which is great, but they're not really offering more the freedoms that we're looking for we're like hey now I'm the king yay all hail the king you know it's kind of like a little club and it's great and they're, gonna be, they're probably going to be working as a national nation Liberland uh, sorry Sealand the principality of Sealand um, is a unique situation where in World War II the UK um, set up a bunch of um, air airship forts really simple ones basically uh, floating concrete barge with the bottom was concrete and these these two pillar, pillars and the top was a platform and it, it was it's the seabed is t 10 meters down down there they pushed them out out and then sunk the bottom and so basically you're just sitting on the ground there um, but after World War II the Nazis never attacked from Norway which they thought they would they didn't have a need for them so they kind of abandoned them and those are kind of taken over owned by different people and now they're owned by a group that has been defending it from pirates and other stuff uh, for for couple decades and they've established themselves as Sealand. After that, the United Nations Convention over the Law of the Sea has moved from three nautical miles out to two nautical miles, but they kind of grandfathered in that tiny little space. That space is, I, I have a hard time actually visualizing it, but that space is about the size of your site. But they actually, they usually have one person there, not always that anymore, and they had a family there at one point that was their family, but so it's, it's, it's tiny, I wish them success. They're not really offering more freedom. They do offer passports. They can they can pronounce you a lord or a king based on how much money you send them. And recently, I think they went up for sale for like a billion dollars worth of wants to buy it. Um, but you don't have much space. Even the water around it isn't that big. That big. But I wish I wish I could go back in the, all these things. I wish I could go back in time because that is ideal. Building a ship is nice. If you could build on a seabed, that's even better because that's cheaper. I could do that whole thing with concrete. This this ship may last. 20, 30, 50 years if we're lucky, and then we'll have to replace it with a new ship. So it, it, on the ocean, the ocean eventually always claims your, your ships, and all ships are temporary. You have to just replace a new one. So this is kind of an economic model for how to go forward. <coughs> you broke it. I'm telling. <laughs> you okay? But, yeah. No, I'm good. <laughs> There's an indentation <coughs> down back there, and he fell back first. We had that in our benches, too. Yeah. One, one of the benches that kind of sinks in the ground, and it was like, wah! Yeah. It's fun. Um, so there's there's nothing there's nothing we can really do with that situation because they were kind of grand for other than they they were there before they were kind of like Rose Island but they were never destroyed um, and they never really offered freedom 
it, it was much smaller. Rose Island, I think, actually was bigger than their, their thing was, even though it was also a floating platform. Um, most sea setting projects you hear about out there are fancy, a fancy house for millionaires that's a few hundred feet offshore. And it's beautiful. Look at the sunsets and mornings in this uh, from your bed. You can you know, that's that's what most seasteading is. We're technically a seastead because we're homesteading on the ocean, and we're, we're the seasteading institute has us listed on their site as one of the active projects out there, one of the twelve active projects out there, which is really cool. So thank you, thank you for seasteading institute for everything you do for us, and continue to do for us. Um, but we're not anything like those other seasteading projects. We're we're not about catering to the ultra rich you know we're, we're trying to get this as cheap as possible so we can get as many of those refugees and anyone from any other country who wants to live there um to be able to afford to move there because uh, this is a uh, it's gonna cost money um any other questions so where is freedom haven in the process of making this a reality uh we're in phase two of four phases um, there's there's four phases total. Phase one is uh, the initial design, coming up with it, figuring out everything out, if will this thing actually work. Phase two is what we're in right now. That's the exploratory campaign, um, like a presidential campaign before the, the guy runs for president. He wants to see is this possible? Is there enough interest out there? And usually, get yeah, they get false results and they think they can win, but they can't. Whatever. Um, we're right now on a marketing campaign and to share messages like this and say. <laughs> Does this, uh, do you guys like to say, do you hope this will succeed? If so, give us money and then that will pay for us at marketing for the next year. And um, our goal this year is, is to raise uh, $2,000 uh, for the marketing. All phase two total is, is $20,000 and that will allow us to bring it to more more stuff. If we get enough money from Porkfest this year, we're gonna go to um, uh, Freedom Fest in, in a month. Um, not gonna be able to do that much if you has this year because it's the first time I'm going there. It'll be mostly just to connect and figure out how everything works and stuff. But um, so that's phase two. Phase three is two million dollars, and that's that's when people, the actual people, actual investors, will put five hundred dollars of serious money for their cabin, and that two million dollars will go towards San Francisco Heavy Industries, um, and also for marketing. But uh, most of it to San Francisco Heavy Industries uh, to actually create the professional designs down to every ribbon and so forth, the prototyping and so forth, all the professional stuff you do when you actually make a mega ship. And then the next phase is phase four, which uh, each of these each of these cabins is $65,000, and that includes um, the 10 years of maintenance and so forth. So basically you're paying for a cabin for 10 years, um, and you have it, it's been 10 years of rent, so basically $6,500 for a cabin, which is, honestly, it's, it's kind of cheap for, for the ocean, even though it's a lot of money to come up with up front. Um, and then that's the money that San Francisco Industries or whichever shipyard we go with will actually build the ship. We'll get all the other components we need. For example, we need two uh, ocean-going um, tugboats. We need bathymetric equipment um, and a whole bunch of other things like that that we'll, we'll need, including the company to make the concrete platform because that'll be a separate one. Um, and, uh, and that's it. So right now, we're the, 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 the whole structure we, plan, uh, we estimate would be done by 2037. It's a long ways out. That's 14 years in the future. But this is a big project we're building in the city. Um, so that's where we are right now. Did I answer your question? Um, is there like a... Where is it going to be? Uh, South Bay of Bengal is where we're currently looking at it between India, and India, Sri Lanka, and uh, Singapore. 75% of the world's traffic travels, travels through there. So you can still buy stuff from Amazon, and it might just come there a couple days later because you'll have to go to its main port, and then we'll have to have a ship that comes out there yeah, you know, you'll be integrated into into a global market um, because of economies of scale. It's cheaper to ship a banana halfway around the world because a container ship holds twenty four thousand containers on it, and it only has a crew of twenty people, whereas a truck holds two of these containers on it, or, or two twenty five equivalent units. Actually, they're fifty three feet, so it's basically two point two, whatever you know. Um, but it has one per one driver, so one one driver for basically two TEUs as opposed to twenty people for twenty four thousand TEUs. The economies of scale make it cheaper to ship a banana halfway around the world than to ship an apple to a neighboring state. So out on the ocean, shipping will actually be cheaper, um, but we will have to import most of our food. It will actually be cheaper to import um, corn from Iowa all the way over there than to grow your sea farm that's right there next to you because of economies of scale. A lot of people are doing it because it's a free market. It's a bit of like, I want my organic kale or whatever, and that's what they want. That's great, you know. Um, did I answer your question? Yeah. I do apologize. There's five years of data and information behind us. There's just so much we've been researching, whatever. And I 
don't know how to give just the right amount. So it's like, you want to ask a question, here's a memory dump. And everyone's like, oh, my head hurts. Stop it. Back up a little bit. You know, and people vomit and throw up. And people start well, eyes rolling back in the head and convulsing and stuff. And get the defibrillator. You know. I think maybe you were in the wrong hub. <laughs> What's the cost, the estimated cost of building the structure? The whole the whole project is uh, estimated at two hundred and sixty million dollars. The the price will be uh, refined in phase three when Sensor Canada Industries does the final designs, and they say, well, actually, this part's going to be cheaper, this part's more expensive. We want to know more about it. That that seems really low. Yes. Okay. That's our goal. What, <laughs> what does one of these, you know, cruise ships cost? Uh, yeah, cruise ships closer cost to like a billion. One point seven billion. Okay. And an aircraft carrier is seventeen point five billion. Well, but this okay. is based on the technology of the the new shipping container. Samsung Industries actually each year, despite inflation, makes the container shipping container these big monster shipping containers yeah. cheaper than the one the previous year and larger than the one previous year. They're now about one hundred and sixty five million dollars for a container ship, these big container ships. So the question is, why don't we just buy one of those? You can, but they're not set up for people to live in the live right, in those right, spaces. Right. And they have like one walk space. You can get a container ship stuff. for 160 million. 165 million, yes. Okay. Brand All new right. one. Well, so you're you're ballparking then. All right. And and this won't be as, as wide as those. This will be about half half the width, mm -hmm. half the length, um, and only have 4,000 TEUs instead of 24,000 TEUs because there's right. going to be larger hallways. We'll have all this plumbing involved and so forth. But even though this is this is very ambitious, being that low, and I and we know that, but that is the goal. We want to make this as economic as possible. Uh, thanks to everyone for your time. If this is something you guys want to support, um, please consider donating to the project because uh, we want to go to Freedom Fest this year too and see if we can promote it out there as well. That's Las Vegas? Uh, this year it's in Memphis. Memphis? Yeah, which actually just happens to be eight hours from where I live in Iowa, so that's great. Yeah. All right. Well, thanks everyone. Well, thank you so much. Good. If I were going there, I would be running a shuttle to shore. <laughs> yes, that's yeah, great. That'd be your gig. <laughs>